Bill was very specific about what he wanted his foundation to do and not to do. And I was one of his estate trustees, so we were working on settling the, the estate and moving the money over to the foundation, as well as one of the original foundation trustees. And none of us had any experience with a billion dollar startup that two days after he died, people expected to be dispersing money. It was the craziest time you can imagine. But the structure that Bill chose for his foundation was a private foundation, which means one donor. It was set up in perpetuity, which means we invest the money and we pay out 5% a year or a little more or less than 5%. And he also wanted it to be very specific and geographically specific. Brian mentioned he was born in Greeley, Colorado. When he, when his, during the Depression, he moved to Iowa with his family came back to Hobbs where mom and dad started, or dad started an insurance business. Then he went to Wyoming. And then in Utah, I'm gonna tell you a little story about Utah a little bit later in and why Utah was, was one of the important states uh, to Bill. <coughs> that wasn't the only specificity we had. He said 30% of the annual payout goes to the scholarship program. The scholarship program is an operating program for us, a very high touch program because of the population that we work with. And then he said, there are 10 funding areas that I want you to work in, which is a lot, a lot for an, a foundation to, to try and be expert in. So, you know, 10 funding areas, all this money, how hard could this be, right? I think that's how Bill felt about it. But I tell you, we really messed up the first couple of years and we messed it up pretty bad. And what we did, Phil, uh, Phil Hogue had been tapped by Bill as the CEO and Phil was a trusted colleague of Bill's and loved Bill Daniels, they were very close. Phil did and the board was right there with him. We did what you're trained to do in business, which is if you don't have expertise in something, hire the best person you can find. Make sense? That's what Phil did. Hired people that had very good experience in scholarship programs and in grants. And they did what? They hired the rest of the staff. Culture was born. And the culture could not have looked less like Bill Daniels if you had deliberately set out to do it. And I think uh, several, not several of us, three of us were on both board, estate trustees and board trustees and we were really busy over here and we're starting to hear from the community some things that are just not sounding right. So I think as a board it took us about a year to wake up and say, boy, we have, we have screwed up the most important thing he wanted us to do which was honor his, his direction. So Phil had gotten quite ill about that time. He remained on the board until he passed away, but Hank Brown came in then as the CEO. And we started working very closely on looking at overhead. What were we doing in terms of how much money were we spending to put money out? And who were the people that we had making these judgments uh, on, on the first, first level for, for the fund? We had 70 people on staff. We now have 38. <laughs> we have more money now. We had offices in Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, and Utah. We had lots of people working in those offices. They weren't giving away that much money, but we had people there. We now cover those states with a part-time person, and we're giving out more money there. But we spent a lot of time dealing with the overhead and the culture. The other thing then that, uh, that Hank worked on, and I was chairing the grants committee at the time, is we spent about two years saying, what did Bill Daniels mean when he said, I wanna fund programs for the aging? So we looked at all kinds of things. One of the projects that Dale uh, is still, still managing, but we had, for some reason, <laughs> Bill's assistants kept 55 years of his correspondence, and he wrote a lot. So we have scanned all of these into a system where we can, we can pull out how did Bill Daniels feel about you name the topic. So we looked at a lot of these letters. We looked at his personal philanthropy. We interviewed his estate attorneys. We interviewed his colleagues. And we said, when he was talking about aging, what did he care about? And that was how we ended up defining the grant strategies that we have, uh, that we have now. Hank was there for about three years, and then he went up to the University of Colorado, and the board said at that time, will you come over and finish this grant business and this focus on donor intent? And I said, I will if it's unanimous. 
And I will if we go in understanding that I will re replace at least half of this staff as fast as I can because they don't honor the donor. And the board's response was, why only half? So we were, we were <laughs> off and running at that point. So I have been there. I thought I'd be there a couple years. I've been there almost 10, which is astounding to me. But I think the, the areas that have been the focus for me, donor intent, donor intent, donor intent. I mean, the book that Brian mentioned in the packets that you have tells you how to download it. If you don't want to download it, give us a card and we'll mail you one. But the book has a lot of the letters that Bill wrote and a lot of the work that, that he did. Uh, we have done a series of videos, uh, six legacy videos that explain that for future boards. This is all being done for future boards and future staff who wouldn't know him. Our board now knew the man and we all love the man and we're all totally dedicated to doing this his way. And I think unanimously, if he were here today, we would counsel him against perpetuity because the chance of it maintaining integrity, or not integrity, the chances of it ma maintaining consistency with his direction over time is probably very small. So how are we doing? We started with a billion. We have given away 600 million, and we only have a billion four left. So things have been, things have been pretty good. You want to put up the slide on the, the portfolio? The, um, our, our portfolio is pretty well divided in a lot of different, I figure this audience might care about this. But the way it works in a foundation is that we set the policy, we set our target ranges, and, and then we hired a consultant. We work with Monticello, and they bring us deals that fit within what we have available and fit within those areas. During the 08, 09 era, I think everybody was a little uncertain about what the future was going to hold, and we were probably more conservative, well, we were more conservative than we wish we'd been because we left some money on the table. But overall, our average return is 12%. So that works pretty good. That's been a low of 3% one year and a high of 24% one year. So it, it varies. We have two types of scholarships. We have the traditional Daniel Scholar, which is high school to a four-year institution. We have awarded 3,226 scholarships since Bill passed away. 3,000 scholarships. Now they're able to go, they're able to go anywhere they want to go in the United States. Um, they can pursue any degree they want, although if Bill were here, he wouldn't want them in business. Um, our selection process has tightened over the years, and what, we, what we've learned along the way, our, our scholars are all need-based. It's one of the criteria Bill set up, but what we've really focused on is we want the person who needs the money but doesn't have an entitlement attitude, who is going to work really hard to make the most of it. So there's a lot in the screening to get at uh, trying, to, trying to weed out the, the entitlement mentality. So far, we've had them in 500 different universities. Um, all, all states except Alaska, right, Debbie? It's Alaska that hasn't had any. Um, I mentioned in the group earlier that a few years ago, a number of our scholars were graduating and having a hard time finding jobs. So we spent quite a bit of time talking to employers in our four-state area, people who were running businesses in the areas where our kids were getting degrees, and said, what are you looking for? And the feedback was almost universal in every single case. So from that experience, we developed 32 little video vignettes that we make them watch. It's part of the scholarship requirement. It's how do you present yourself for an interview? How do you, you know, it's free enterprise. It's all the things that mattered to Bill. We also do etiquette with our scholars when they come together. This was something that was so important to Bill. He said people will judge you based on how well you can handle yourself. One of the things that we say a lot in the organization is you, you never know who you're going to meet because Bill would talk about sitting next to somebody on a plane and doing a million dollar deal with them the next day. So it was kind of fun to do that. Um, so that's, that was which class, Dale, 14? So, we're right in the process right now of the next class selection, and we'll probably, instead of 250, select 230 this year. And you may say, if the assets are up, why are you doing that? The formula is that we are last dollar. So when you talk to higher ed folks, if you know what that is, last dollar is after the FAFSA gods, whoever they are, wherever they are, <laughs> determine how much the family should be able to pay. 
So our families are very low income families with lots of kids and the family contribution number has just gone up and up and up. And we've been very concerned about that. So we went into the board last time and said, don't think the big guy would like this. And they said, what do you suggest? So we said, well, it would seem like you could just pay more of the family contribution, but you can't do that. The fast for gods won't, won't accept that. So we're now in the process of setting up separate contracts with all these universities to say, we want to cover the family contribution portion, but we want you, university, to take a piece of that action. <clears throat> so we're having great reactions so far, but it's going to be a very, very slow process. So essentially, it will look like a full ride at the end of the day, but they'll have a full ride with Pell Grants, any state funding, anything, that, anything else that they have. Um, then we have a second scholarship program called the Boundless Opportunity Scholarship. We have a quote from Bill where he talks about America being the land of boundless opportunities for all. So in the Boundless Opportunity Scholarship, the students are not the typical high school to college age. They're adults, they're returning military, they're emergency responders, there are several categories. But we make grants to the universities within our four states. They in turn re-grant it for this non-traditional student. Uh, we've had 4,300 of those. And those people are more mature, more appreciative. They've had to earn their way a little bit more and it's, it's one of our favorite things to do.